Okay, we're back live here at the Strata Conference in Silicon Valley. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconAngle.com and SiliconAngle.tv, and I'm joined with my co-host. I'm Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org. This is uh, day three for us at Strata. Wikibon.org has all the research. SiliconAngle.com is uh, the news and editorial, so go check out those sites. Check out SiliconAngle.tv where we broadcast all the videos. Uh, we've got a huge... Uh, day today on top of yesterday's, and we've got a company called CalPont here today. They uh, do massively parallel columnar databases. We're going to talk to Jim Tomaday, who is the CTO. Jim, welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. Yeah, so this is a, is a hot space, and, and um, help us understand sort of where you fit into this new emerging database sector. Sure, so we, we internally we offer uh, the scalability you expect from a MapReduce offering. Uh, we're actually mapped to a columnar storage that allows for some tremendous IO efficiency. So we, we do things fast, um, and part of our package is just an overall ease of use component because the, the combination of the two technologies allows access to the data to be very easy. So, um, you know, we're, we're very familiar with the, the verticas and the aster datas sure. and, the, and the green plums. Um, uh, how do you fit into that space? I mean, you know, obviously you got the Teradatas and the, you know, the traditional legacy Oracle stuff, the IBM, but sure. then you had this emergence of these sort of new MPP type players. You fit in there or are you new new? So we're, we fit in there to degrees. We certainly see those, those competitors. Mm -hmm. um, we have a columnar storage. In some cases we're going to map to the IO efficiency you would expect of Vertica. In some cases the IO is going to be similar. Internally though, we actually have a, a different distribution of work model rather than being a sort of a a database on top of a database with the most distributed node running SQL, and then that data being uh, you know stitched back together. We actually translate the SQL into MapReduce internal to our engine, and then that workload is distributed across uh, and all the cores in a single server, all the cores in a cluster of servers. So tell us a little bit about the company. When did you guys start? And talk so about we funding. actually this effort's been in place since '06. Uh, the product itself was um, in in basically benchmark testing in '08, uh, launched in '09. In Infini our, InfiniDB. InfiniDB product, right. yes. Um, launched in 09 uh, in our open source and, and then the uh, commercial in uh, the following, following year in February. So your thrust is in Hadoop? Or? No, so our, our thrust really is, is really around a, uh, a, a new solution for tradi traditional analytics. So it's not necessarily a solution that's for unstructured data because columnar by definition is applies structure to it. So, but certainly there's plenty of uh, use cases for structured data, and we just make that operation much simpler. So it, it translates for us into you know, web analytics solutions. Um, uh, we talked yesterday with a, a company that's doing genomics for livestock. Um, so different applications come into play here. So how is this concept of big data changing the traditional enterprise data warehouse world? In so it's, it's certainly, in, in my opinion, certainly moving them off of the traditional platforms, that's for certain. So the, the, the general purpose database has, has not solved problems at two dimensions. So either at uh, entity access at scale, uh, there are better solutions, and then addition, uh, at analytics at scale, there are better solutions, and I think there's those two uh, dimensions are, are basically stretching the traditional technologies. Can we talk about column stores for a minute? Maybe yeah. maybe just do a little you know columnar 101 for the audience. Sure, sure. Well, certainly there's there's uh, some confusing terms out there. So there's column family, that really is uh, a flex an access to an entity with a flexible structure, and that's not what we are. So we're actually uh, one one definition sort of a true column database. We actually will just will divide each of the fields, each of the columns, into separate stores that can be accessed independently. And so what that does mean is a couple things. You can access, uh, you know, any query. We can we can use just the columns um, required for the query. And so you, the I/O characters are far far lower than traditional systems. And then you can also uh, it's more flexible in terms of any columns that aren't part of the query just don't pay any penalty for those. And so it's easier to use from that standpoint. Okay, so you're saying that basically uh, columns are, are better than rows in terms of I/O efficiency. Well, it it's, depends on the workload. Right. So as long as the workload is is a large queries against um, you know uh, uh, millions or billions of rows against a data set that's uh, billions or trillions, it's it's a clear winner uh, for any kind of entity access. The other is true. Co uh, row base is, is better, or column family, or one of these other structures. Okay, so um, so that that makes sense, and 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 now. So what's your open source play? Talk about that a little bit. So we have a, a community offering that's out there that allows people to try the product. There's some, some reserve features uh, into our, our um, enterprise. But um, we want people to be able to try the product. It's, it's part of a strategy to let people know about us, certainly. Um, we are also a MySQL storage engine. 
So that means that existing tools that connect to MySQL will also connect to our engine. Now internally, we're, um, we're a non-standard MySQL store engine, storage engine. Uh, we actually will take over the execution of the query and do all the joins within our layer, rather than have that happen in the MySQL kernel. Okay, and, and um, so are you a software only? So we're a software only solution, yes. Okay, wh wh what, does that, what does that give you? Well, so just implement uh, flexibility around implementation. So we are um, looking at even uh, solutions beyond uh, Intel architectures in terms of where we're going to run. How do we get to uh, significant uh, parallelism? Um, and uh, that, 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 in my opinion, that doesn't appear to be a, a solution that we want to build the hardware out because that tends to, to become stale quickly. So you're, you're implying that you can scale better, um, you're more portable? When yeah, so, that, so that's, that's, that's been demonstrated for us. We're, we're very happy with, with both the scalability and the portability of the system, yes. Jim, I, Jim I, you got a CTO, and uh, we want to apologize to Nick, your VP of marketing who's out there. Nick I, uh, wanted to come on theCUBE, but... Yeah, never apologize know, to marketing. D Dave and I don't like to give up the microphone, so uh, okay. you know, we want to talk to the tech, tech guys. But there's been a big tech conversation around performance. Obviously, performance sure. is great. Predictive analytics and real-time analytics are, are the hot areas everyone's forging into ahead of. But the database architecture in hardware has changed. We had uh, um, some folks on um, veterans in Silicon Valley, Scott Detson uh, at Pure Storage, talking about all flash, no more spindles. Right. So David Floyer is doing some research around IO-centric uh, architecture and infrastructure. And with flash and virtualization, it's changing how people are using the hardware side for maximizing performance and then there's software on top of it. So how do you guys vector into that trend technically from a product standpoint and for all the people out there that are implementing these new flash architectures, they now can use commodity hardware, create multiple different kind of databases. What's your view on that perspective? So, so my opinion actually differs slightly. So I think that those technologies are, are absolutely differential allowing more IOPS into the system. But IOPS themselves are actually a solution for, uh, for entity access rather than analytic access in my opinion. And so it's, it's, a, it's truly differential in that use case. But for ours, we're, already, we're not um, IOPS bound in any use case in our engine. So the differential performance from, from minimizing uh, the cost of an IOP is, is small. And, and the other part of that is that certainly where disk is the obvious um, enemy for performance, um, there's a solution there, but there's also efficiencies within processing in, in the, the CPU memory cache that, that we solve and, and that, that aren't affected by things like those technologies. Okay, so Avi Mehta was on yesterday talking about analytics. Dave, I can't recall specifically the exact quote, but he was saying something around how analytics is paired up. What was his comment around that? Do you remember that? Did you? Did you he uh, was... Um, analytics is tied to the, data is tied to the analytics. Where you people put the analytics as a big strategic decision? Do you remember what he said there? He was referring to, um, the uh, essentially the Hadoop Bass job versus the analytics activity, um, and 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 not making uh, a, a, a choice between the two, but actually trying to bring the two together is essentially what he was talking. Is, about. is there a new analytics paradigm that people aren't seeing that you guys are that, that you're seeing success in? I guess that's my question. There's a little different philosophies on how you do the analytics with multiprocessing. I mean, I mean MPP, for example. Well, so I think I think. This is, I think this is the answer to your question, but I mean, the end users are interested in the ease of use of the system, right? So it's a combination of features that allows for um, you know, easy access to a high performance system without understanding the complexity is, is, is easier to use for the market. And that's where we think we've got a nice edge because we've, we map the SQL to our MapReduce layer transparently. So the end user isn't aware of all that processing, that it's being processed different, but underneath the covers it is. So, you know, while, um, you know, one of the terms that we, we found in our customers is that um, for Warner Music Group, they talk about, uh, we let them turn their SQL developers into big data developers. And so we think that transparency is interesting. What experience are you having when you go into these big, uh, your clients, you got to go in, you got to do the whiteboard, you got to meet with the tech guys, sure. and they want to have that business conversation. Bill Schmarzer was recently on talking about the cultural change in these companies. Yeah. And we've heard the theme earlier on, it's a talent game, and, and people are getting educated, but they're not, you know, not, I mean, they're not idiots. I mean, they're in tech, they're doing SQL, and it's been around, structured data is important. What are you seeing as the key ahas for the clients, and what are the stumbling blocks that they have to get over? Well, so to go back to one of Dave's point, it's, it's part of our open source strategy. So in many cases, the, the tech guys get a chance to get in and get uh, their hands on the product, understand the capabilities of the system, and for us, that's half the battle. So, um, you know, the rest of it is, is certainly forming a bond, making sure they understand, walking through the architecture and things like that, all the traditional tools, but, but a, key, a key resource for us really is our uh, access to open source capabilities. So there was a run on uh, 
a new next gen enterprise yes. data warehouse yes. companies there. It's, it reminded me of an NFL draft, John, right? <laughs> You know, Bill Belichick takes a, a left tackle, and all of a sudden, all left tackles start going right. I mean, so, yeah. um, so there was a, a spate, you know, Natiza and, and Greenplum and Vertica and Astra Data, and now it's sort of gotten quiet again. Yes. Um, what's your take on all that? Um, you must have been excited watching it. Well, so, so have things calm down now. Or? Certainly, these are interesting times. Yeah. I agree with that assessment. Um, so things I think have gone past that little bubble, right, where people were excited and concerned that the draft pick is gone. So I think that's true. I think there's, there are people making more seasoned decisions about acquisitions. Um, but I believe that there are still places for differential technology uh, to come to market. Okay, and you guys, um, so where are you at in terms of the company, the funding, headcount, things um, like that? So we're headcount just uh, 23, 24, uh, customer count uh, three dozen and moving. Um, Active pool is much larger that so we're really excited about where we're going in the future. We're in the middle of uh, ramping headcount internally to do more partner opportunities, um, you know, extending and, and you know, doing things exactly like this to let people know about the product. And how about funding? You guys, um... so, so we're well funded. We're, uh, we're actually uh, private equity, private, uh, uh, privately funded. Great. My, my final question, because we got on a time limit here on our next guest. Um, we're talking about an application explosion. Obviously, analytics is big. We had Mike Dauber on um, and other VCs we've talked to here, Frank Artali, uh, who spoke on the phone yesterday with and Ping Lee from Excel. Um, analytics is really the hottest area. So what are you seeing in terms of the enablement of where analytics is going? Obviously, there's it's the dashboards and all that good stuff. What are the key apps that you're seeing that you guys want to enable and what kind of uh, benefits so are you predi talking about? Predictive, as you mentioned, is, is, is tremendous. That's going to allow um, for uh, much more powerful use of data uh, to deliver a difference for the business. Um, so that's that's the leading trend that we've got. This, some of the um, you know certainly visualization tools are, are critical. Uh, I'm not going to pretend to be the expert around those. I'm, I'm more the, the backbones guy. Yeah. What's your advice to uh, your friends and colleagues and customers when they ask you, uh, hey, what's going on with big data and analytics? What do I need to know about? Um, what, how do I get started? What do I do? I have all this old tech. Well, so my, I have a 16-year-old daughter who's in the middle of uh, career decisions, <laughs> what to do, and so I talked to her about, there's certainly tremendous opportunities uh, in data, so the, the, what's, what's happening five years from now and 10 years from now with data is going to be just life-changing across a wide variety of industries. We've got a, a sense of it looking, looking five or 10 years back, but I think the future is even more interesting. Okay, well, thanks so much for coming on theCUBE. Jim Tomanay, thanks so much. You're in Frisco, Texas, not San Francisco, but it's in Texas, it's near Dallas. Uh, you guys love Texas. Mark Hopkins lives in Texas. We have a Silicon Angle office in Texas. And, uh, Kean's there. Kean's there, and we love, we love the Texas uh, hospitality. Good old barbecue, and you guys are great, yep. uh, friendly folks down there, and good tech scene, so uh, thanks for